Good evening. Welcome to the Marin City Council workshop for the month of December. We'll begin with our pledge to the flag. I'll ask Councilman Vigliotti to please lead us in said pledge. Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilman. Let the record reflect that all members are present and accounted for in a virtual setting this evening. We'll begin with review of the minutes of our November 4th and November 9th regular meetings, as well as the November 9th closed session. Uh, I will read our statement from that closed session at this time. November 9th, 2020 at 8 p.m. Uh, in by virtual, uh, it was motioned by Mayor Pro Tem Foster with a second by Council Member Hale that we adjourn into closed session following our regular meeting. The purpose of the session was to consult with Council to obtain legal advice. Topics discussed was a pending issue with the Maryland Department of the Environment and persons virtually present at the closed session were noted above being Mayor Pro Tem Foster, Councilman Vigliotti, Councilwoman Fuller, Councilman Hale, Councilman Haynes, also in attendance were City Manager Weeprecht, City Attorney Gullo, City Clerk Kalman, Director of Public Works Kevin Smeek, and Brian Lubenow of CDM Smith. I do like to note uh, to the clerk if you could please add my name to those present there since I'm not listed at the top. I would appreciate it. I know I presided, but let's not leave anything to chance. There were no actions taken, it was simply discussion, and the motion to adjourn was at 8.32 p.m. by Mayor Pro Tem Foster and a second by Councilman Haynes and carried uh, unanimously five to zero. Uh, in accordance with the Open Meetings Act, that has been read aloud. I will now ask the council if they have any comments or questions on the minutes of November 4th, November 9th, or the November 9th closed session. Okay, noting the request I already made uh, for the closed session review, we shall move on. I'm now going to ask the council if there is anything on the agenda that is a conflict of interest for them this evening. No, sir. No, sir. Okay, everyone is good. We shall move on. We have this evening in front of us Ordinance 07-2020, Amendment to Chapter 153. This is for park impact fees. Who would like to start us out? I can do that. Yes, sir. So as we've discussed uh, off and on for a number of years, uh, what we currently have is a fee in lieu of open space that's linked to the subdivision chapter of our code. So not every dwelling that's built pays that fee in lieu of open space. We often refer to it as a park impact fee, but that's not really what it is. So in recent years, we've talked about the idea of adopting a park impact fee that every new dwelling would pay um, in addition to that fee in lieu of open space. So when we have a major subdivision in the pipeline, they have the option of either dedicating a certain portion of the property and it has to be usable to some extent. It can't be steep slopes or things like that that are unusable, but they have the option of either paying a fee for each lot or dedicating open space to the city. Some communities uh, have dedicated open space. Most of them pay the, the fee in lieu of open space. Uh, but since it's not consistent, and also we see that even if a community develops or uh, leaves the open space or provides the open space, there's still an impact on the parks. There's still uh, people joining recreation programs, little league, football, soccer, even though the development might provide open space, there's still an impact on our parks. So this fee will go to, if passed, will go to every new dwelling uh, and 
that will be in addition to the fee in lieu of open space. So if a new subdivision comes in the pipeline and they don't dedicate any open space, they will end up paying $2,500 per dwelling towards the park, both the fee in lieu of open space and the new park impact fee. So the idea is really to give us a little more uh, funding to be able to further develop our existing park network. Um, we really don't fall short on having park acreage available. What we fall short on is sometimes having the money to develop additional sports fields and things like that as the new homes come online and and generate more demand for those fields. So obviously we're adequate now, but we're right at that point where we need to, you know, as the city grows and we have new people joining rec programs and everything, we're going to need to develop additional fields and this is going to give us a funding mechanism to help do that. So um, the ordinance before you um, has the usual um, underlined for for new text and strike through for delete deletions. Uh, so what this one does is it adds the new park impact fee and then it changes the name of the other reference to it to fee in lieu of open space, which is really more accurate than the, than the old title. And again, that fee in lieu of open space ties back to the subdivision chapter 180. And I think that's, a, I hope, an adequate summary of things. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, we can talk a little bit about the mechanics of it. And um, we do hope to in the coming month, provide you some more details on that. Um, Lorena and Jay and I have, have spent some time together working on that. And um, Jay is giving things one more look over and that um, supporting stuff is actually gonna come through Jay. So um, that'll be coming out to you before, well before it's time to vote on this ordinance next month. Okay, so just to, I wanna clarify a little bit there. Um, currently, developers have two options when they build here. Option one is they provide, in some way, ample open space to the city, at which point they don't have to pay anything towards the park impact. Um, otherwise, if they don't want to provide that land, they would pay $1,500 per unit to us. What this is doing is adding to that an actual park impact fee that regardless of open space, they're going to pay thousand dollars per unit if they decide to not provide open space it would be added the fifteen hundred dollars to that being a total of twenty five hundred so bare minimum per house or per unit we would receive at least one thousand dollars which would help as we grow make sure that our parks can keep up with that when you consider things even our playgrounds when we go to replace them half the time we need to find some sort of grant to make that happen because we just don't have the funds to replace a playground and a lot of it is because with the growth we've had we're just not seeing any fees supporting our park program is that adequate okay any questions from the council on this as it lays in front of you councilman vigliotti uh, thank you mr mayor i have uh, two questions I, I guess the first one probably should go to jay because it has to do with the analytical you know, definition of, of terms um Jay, if you go uh, to the first page of the ordinance on line 38, and, um, and I guess for me, uh, this line, there's a little bit of, of, I don't know what the right word would be, um, maybe confusion. Uh, it, it talks about how uh, the fees uh, are going to be put into an account or accounts to be used exclusively for park acquisition and park capital improvements. And it's particularly the, the phrase capital improvements, it's kind of caught my attention. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of uncomfortable with that particular part of the, the phrase capital improvements, because when I think of, of capital improvements, I'm thinking of, um, you know, uh, like an amount, like a certain amount of money that would have to be met in order to qualify as capital, or I guess it would have to be, uh, I guess what, something other than maintenance to the park. Um, in addition to that, the idea that there would be uh, improvements is the word improvements kind of catches me off guard too, because 
you know, my mind, when you're talking about improving something, it's like, oh, well, we have a shed right now that has a couple of lawnmowers in it. Well, let's build a new shed because we're going to improve over the old shed. So, you know, what happens if we decide we want to put some trees into a park, but they don't meet the threshold or the definition of a capital improvement? Um, or for that matter, if we decide we want to create some kind of new capital project within a park that doesn't actually meet the definition of improvement itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, all that, yes. So I guess what we could do, to, first of all, the accounting definition of capital improvement, that when you start talking about spending a certain threshold of money, is probably not what we're getting at here. What we're trying to get at is not maintenance. So for example, we don't want to use this money to mow lawns, okay? We don't want to use this money to pay salaries, that kind of thing, because those are reoccurring costs that are, are maintenance in nature, and they don't have a long-term uh, use. So instead of money, let's look at the, the useful life of an item. So when you put a swing set in, it has more than uh, immediate useful life. It can be used for several years, okay? So maybe we can redefine capital improvement to maybe narrow it. I'll think of some language, but it said it can say something like and not maintenance items. However, you got to get down. You got to put your head around or maybe we need to, to talk about it more. If I'm going to build a new building to put those mowers in, that is a capital improvement. However, let's say I have an existing building and that building needs to be renovated because it's the roofs falling apart. So I need a new roof on that building. That too could be a capital item because it's gonna have a longer useful life than just maintenance. However, if I'm just going to maybe um, buy new hinges for the door type of thing, that's probably not a capital improvement because it they wear out, something like that. Not a very great example, but that's what we could do in that situation. The goal here is for this money to not only be able to expand the footprints of parks, okay, so the area you do things in, but the activity that you can do in the park. Because the theory here is if we had one swing set when the town had a thousand people and now the town has 2,000 people, we probably need two swing sets and so on and so forth. And this is the money that should be put in a pot to expand those types of things. Does that help? That, that makes perfect sense. So would, you, would everybody, I guess, find it amenable to maybe replace park capital improvements maybe with language like park improvement and development or something? Something that I guess is a little less constrictive because you know, I mean, again, like if you like you talking about like the footprint, we already have like the park and we want to develop a new area of the park. Could a new development of area, new area of development within a park still qualify as an improvement? Sure. Well, if you and remember, I think we can figure that out. I think if you remember our current uh, capital improvements for the park, the expansion Memorial Park is part of those capital improvements. So that's a prime example. Um, of what you're talking about. I will draw your attention, and Jay, maybe you want to address this. I did notice from that same sentence, compared to same page lines 48 and 49, uh, we go from saying for park acquisition and park capital improvements to whereas in the next paragraph we say to be used exclusively for park acquisition and development. Right. Do we want those terms to match or are we purposely leaving them different? I think we can make them match and be consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we have to kind of, we, what we have to realize is let's say that uh, you're, you're gonna expand Memorial Park. So that is a park improvement. It's a capital expense, it's a development. There aren't, you're not just buying capital things though, right? Because if I'm gonna put a new widget in, it may have engineering costs, which are not capital, but they're associated to a capital item and will be paid for out of this fund because it's about a capital project. So we can fix that. We can do what you're talking about. Okay. I, I would suggest changing both of those to read park acquisition, capital improvements, and development. Right. I think put all three in both of those places, I think that would cover us. Was that Would that satisfy you, Councilman Vigliotti? Uh, yes, Mr. Rear, that certainly would. Thank you. And Clara, you have that noted so that we can follow up on that. Thanks. Okay. All right. And, 
Oh, and, and my second question, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and I guess this is just like a, a general question to anybody. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, unless I missed it, and I know that uh, the, uh, I think between lines 44, um, yeah, around line 44, 45, it talks about uh, there shall be assessed against each dwelling unit prior to securing a building permit, a fee in lieu of open space. So I guess my question is this entire ordinance, does this apply only to new and future developments or to existing developments that haven't necessarily secured like a new phase or a building permit for new buildings yet? Mr. Weeprick? This would be effective uh, the, the day after it's enacted. Um, so we will need to have some conversations with developers who have projects going on the ground right now. So, um, you know, we do have a, a DARA with the two principal projects that are under development um, that still have building permits to pull. And there may be some uh, desire to negotiate on, on those DARAs. So something may be coming back to you uh, within the next month or for next month's meeting. So that is, but if enacted, this would apply immediately. So anything that hadn't already received its building permit um, would be subject to the new the new fee or could be subject to the new fee. And do we have any idea about what uh, what is outstanding still? And if not, you don't have a number, that's okay. Okay. Um, if you take a look a little farther in your packet on the water allocation resolution, on the allocation scheme, uh, that'll give you an idea of how many units are left in each of the ongoing pro projects, development projects. So um, the exception there is, I think we're still carrying Tawny Town Crossing, but they have received their building permits. Uh, there's some administrative stuff that's still lagging on that project. That's why it's still showing on your allocation resolution. Okay, so ba I mean, and I'm just trying to do some quick math in my head here. So we're looking at well north of 100 houses that still have that that this could effectively be applied to. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. The rest of Council, do you have any questions or comments regarding Ordinance 07 2020? I think this is another one of those where we've discussed it for many years, and it just took us that moment to finally finally get something on paper. So with nothing else uh, that will be introduced Monday evening, and then we'll be looking to approve next month. Moving on to resolution 2020-14, this is the park impact fees. And I believe this is kind of a, a sister to the previous. Is that correct, Mr. Weeprick? It is. Uh over the past several years, when we have updated ordinances that have a price tag associated with them or a, a fee that's established, we've been trying to not incorporate the fee in the actual ordinance, but to adopt the fee through a resolution. So when the time may come to adjust those fees, we don't have to pass a new ordinance and update the city code book and go through general code to do that we can just adopt an ordinance or a resolution um, to set those fees. So the ordinance refers to setting the fees by resolution. So these are the resolutions to do so. Uh, the first of which, uh, number 14, we wanted to have a standalone resolution for the initial adoption of the new park impact fee. I thought that would give us a better a better historic trail if we need to go back and look at when we first created this fee um, years from now. Um, and the second resolution, uh, number 15, is really just uh, tweaking the language on the existing $1,500 fee to refer to that as the um, park open space or park fee in open space, and, um, and then incorporate also the new park impact fee. So they, it's all kind of a package deal. With that being said, let's travel back in time a few minutes. Do we still want to show the $1,500 in the ordinance for fee in lieu of open space, or do we want to move that out? That way it's simply controlled by future resolutions. But the ordinance does have that struck through um, so that now the, 
when passed, it will say that we shall be established by the mayor and council from time to time by resolution. I believe line 51, it still shows. Oh, okay. On the next page. Thank you. Okay. Yep. We will strike that. Okay. Very good. That way, both fees will in the future simply be changed by resolution. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any questions on this resolution, which is kind of a package deal with the ordinance? All right. Seems cut and dry. Resolution 2020-15. This is our fee schedule for actually 2021. Uh, simply outlines the fees that we do have uh, being added to it, the park impact fee and the park fee in lieu of open space. Uh, I don't believe anything else was added or changed. That is correct. Okay, so everything else has remained the same. Um, any questions from council on this? Okay. Uh, very good. All three of those are going to be introduced on Monday. Is that correct, Mr. Weeprick? Okay, they'll be introduced Monday and then passed in January. Up for adoption Monday evening will be resolution 2020-13. This is our water allocation for December of 2020. Any questions or comments from the council? Okay. We shall then move on. Mr. Weeprick, do you have anything for us for your city manager report? Sure, I'll just mention a couple of things real quick. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the belt filter press um, down under new business. Uh, we have received a bid for that and we'll get into that in detail, but um, the site plan related to that is uh, moving through the review process at Carroll County. So um, it, a little slower than than hoped maybe, but, um, but it is progressing. Um, item number two, um, capital equipment. I threw this in there and we'll talk about this a little more under new business as well, but um, we had the opportunity to apply for Corona relief funding for things that would uh, better facilitate remote meetings and hybrid meetings and things of that nature. Uh, the deadline was, was very tight for us to be able to squeeze this in and get things together and um, Dan worked very closely with myself and, and the mayor and came up with a package, basically a technology package for the council chambers that will allow us to do better production and better um, better remote meetings and better hybrid meetings when we do, if and when we do get to a point where we might have some council members returning to the council chamber, but not, we may not be opening the doors to the public yet. Um, and this equipment that we've got lined up is going to help us produce a better product and have those hybrid type meetings. So it's something that we had to put together very quickly and we'll talk about it a little bit more under new business, but I just wanted to kind of introduce it, uh, under my report here. Um, nothing new really on the SEWL annexation or any other code updates other than the ones on our agenda tonight. Uh, Trevani and Terrace, I do want to clarify, I kind of flipped things on my report, um, right after the council packets went out, I heard back from the county. Uh, the Terranian Terrace project actually is out to bid. And once a bid is awarded, we expect MDE takes about four months to approve permits um, once, once the bid is awarded. So the bid is out. Um, they're actually due today to the county. So hopefully next month um, we will have some news that the county has awarded the bid and that that's all under review by MDE. So we do anticipate construction to be able to start in the spring on that one. And nothing really new on COVID, although the aforementioned project that really does kind of tie into COVID as far as the Corona relief fund money. So, but that's about it for, for me this month, um, unless anybody has questions. Oh, Mr. Mayor, you're, you're muted. That's better. Interesting. Um, okay. Any questions from the council on the city manager report? All right. Any questions on the departmental report as presented to you in your packets? 
Councilman Vigliotti. Uh, with reference to uh, Dan Dennis's IT department report about the potential name for the uh, information tech system. Yes. Our, uh, I'd like to make two suggestions for that, if I might. By all means. All right. So I'm, you know, I was looking through this and I was trying to figure out well, what could we do, you know, in terms of the marketability, like Dan had talked about. And while a lot of these names like Tawny Town Connected are really cool, um, I was almost thinking maybe we should go in, in a slightly different way with respect to the marketability to make it something easier to remember. So I was thinking maybe something along the lines of like the, uh, I'll say the Tawny Town Owl, right? Because you're supposed to send a text message to this system, get information back. And rather than that long, you know, the elongated name, it's simply the owl. It's like, well, when's the next city council meeting? I don't know. Text the owl. What's Brad's phone number? Text the owl, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and of course, we could have a little mascot being an owl or um, potentially going off of Dan's suggestion of Tawny Town United. Maybe we could simply call it Tawny Town Union. And given the fact that we did host elements of the Union Army during the Civil War, our mascot could be like a... Uh, messenger or something in a union outfit so I, I think maybe you know my my suggestion would be to try to approach it in, from that perspective where it's not just the name but it's what we can do with the name as well perfect great suggestions we'll we'll have those discussions another thing about the owl is you have to remember at westminster high school they are the owls so that's kind of you know and, and it's westminster so we don't want to anyway no, great suggestions. I kind of like where you're coming from there. Any other ideas that, that you all have, please, by all means, send them over so that we can kind of discuss them and figure out what we want to do with it. Um, we have picked, I believe, roughly 100 residents at random, essentially one from every street in the city that we're going to send a letter to asking them to kind of beta test this for us. So it's kind of spread out throughout the city and get people to start using it and see how it works for them. So letters will be going out to them probably next week so that they can start testing it. Uh, that way, when we do roll it out, it's hopefully more successful than if we didn't test it ahead of time. We'll put it that way. Although I've been using it and I think it's, it's working great. Um, anything else from the council on departmental reports? All right, moving into our legal report. Mr. Gullah, what do you have for us this evening? Uh, just two items that I want to highlight. One, I will wait until we get to new business to answer any questions about your MDE sewer compliance um, that has some legal components. But I wanted to follow up with what um, the city manager said at item three of new business. So the award of the belt filter press. Um, I know you're all excited about hearing the belt filter press and Brian Lubenow is here about all those details. But unbelievably, I know this is going to be a shocker to you. The belt filter press and building the building also involves us giving an easement to Carroll County over the floodplain that touches the property, that big property that this wastewater treatment plant sits on. Um, it has nothing to do with uh, where we're building the building because we're not building in the floodplain. It just happens to do with we need a permit to build the building because it's over so many square feet and that triggers the floodplain management ordinance for Carroll County and that ordinance requires, I love the language, it requires that we agree to give them an easement over the FEMA floodplain area that crosses our property. And so um, there's, there's no, we, we must, we are required to agree. That's about that simple. So uh, eventually we're going to need your approval to grant the easement. But as uh, Jim had said earlier, this project is moving forward and we want to build it. So, um, we may just get the mayor to sign this easement and then you can ratify it later if we need to get it done to keep the project on track. Uh, there's no choice and it follows the FEMA floodplain maps. We uh, haven't figured out the details on that yet, but uh, you know, you never would have seen that one coming. And uh, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Mr. Gullo. Any questions for the city attorney on his report? All right. Hearing none, we shall move on. We have nothing for old business, so we have some new business. Uh, we'll begin with our monthly financial report. Are there any questions or concerns from the council on the financial report as presented? All right. That'll be up for adopt or for approval, excuse me, on Monday. Next, we have the accounts payables. Any questions on the accounts payables? 
Very good. Once again, to be approved on Monday. And now we have the much awaited award of Belt Filter Press bid. This is super exciting. Actually, I, I do kind of find it exciting because I feel like it's been such a long time since we talked about this, considering the machine that's in place is probably older than most of us. So getting a new one's really exciting, I think. Um, maybe not older than Jim, but it's definitely older than. All right, Ms. Weeper, could you like to start us off on this? You're muted. In your packet was, uh, I believe was the recommendation. I'm trying to scroll through here and find it real quick. Um, and this is one of the many items that Brian is on board for this evening. So um, we did only receive uh, one bid and the bid was from the manufacturer that essentially was the um, the one who makes the, basically the press was specced similar to this manufacturer's um, product. So it's really not surprising that we only received the one bid. Uh, bids were sent out to a number of manufacturers and also uh, were advertised on the county site for us. Uh, they helped us out on that. Uh, but again, we only received the one bid. It uh, is on target and um, we'll be looking for approval on that on Monday night. But I think with that, I will turn things over and let Brian provide some uh, details if there's something you'd like to add, Brian. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'll just add a couple things. First of all, I think it's 1977 is the um, vintage of the existing press. So I'll, I'm not going to say who's older or younger or anything. I'm just going to say that's, I think that's the year. Um, and it was purchased by the city used. Um, um, but I think it was 77 is when it was manufactured. Um, yeah. So the, like Jim mentioned, the, the bid price was um, in line with the, the previous estimates and also in line with the estimates provided earlier in design by the other manufacturers. So um, you know, we, were, we were happy with the bid received and we recommend award to BVP and it's in the amount of $241,500. All right, any questions from council on the belt filter press bid? I know typically we don't like to see just one bid come in, but on something as specialized as this, I, I kind of understand that. Councilman Bigliotti? Uh, just a quick question, and uh, if no one knows the answer to it this evening, that's okay. What is, do we have a general idea of the typical lifespan of a uh, belt press? Well, the, the existing one lasted, you know, 40, 43 years. Um, I think that's more than what you would typically expect, certainly. Um, I want to say 20 years is when um, we would be doing a a life cycle cost analysis for a belt press or really any other kind of major process equipment. That's typically what we would use for a design life. Often they last longer than that, but that's what you would use 20 years. Now, over time, I mean, these things are able to be repaired if the need arises, like we wouldn't have to buy a completely new one given, uh, cause I mean, I, I know that things in the past were produced with the assumption they could be repaired, but I know that's not always the case these days, but this is yeah. a situation where it could be repaired. Absolutely. Yeah. And there are some, you know, maintenance items, uh, the biggest being the, the actual belt itself, that um, it's a serpentine belt that provides pressure on the sludge that squeezes the water out and that, that has to be replaced. That's probably the biggest maintenance item um, might be replaced every five or six years, something like that. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions from the council? I guess I'll just also quickly add that this is the, just as a reminder, um, we're finalizing the design of the improvements where this new belt press will be housed. So that'll be a separate bid um, likely advertising in January or February. Okay. And also in your packets is uh, a proposal from CDM Smith to provide um, engineering construction services um, for the project as we move forward uh, that, that we will add to Monday night's agenda because we will be looking for uh, authorization to um, execute that or to sign that proposal. Very good. 
I believe the one other topic we have Brian on here for is for the MDE sewer compliance. Is that the only other thing he's on here for? And the, uh, well, and look, uh, we also have the CDM Smith uh, 2021 rate proposal and um, the INI engineering proposal. So there's a few oh, items still. Yeah. All right. Well, Mr. Lubinow, you're in for the long haul. Sit tight. Okay. No problem. All right. Up next, we have Bay Restoration Hardship Exemption, something we haven't looked at in a couple of years. Uh, Mr. Weeprick, you want to throw us into it? Sure can. Uh, in 2013, uh, we created our, our Bay Restoration Fee Hardship Exemption Program. It was uh, through a resolution. And back in 2013, it appears that the intent was to revisit the resolution on an annual basis to update the threshold figures. Um, it's come, it came to my attention this year that we have not changed the income parameters on the exemption process since 2013. So now we have some folks who have qualified for the exemption in past years, but even though their income remains somewhat modest uh, because the threshold has not changed in all those years, um, now we're having people who are no longer qualifying because they have, you know, the amount they're receiving for uh, supplementary income or things like that has increased a little bit over the years and our threshold never has. So I reached out to, um, the county administrator and the other city managers and got some feedback on how other towns and um, and the county are doing it. And the majority are not using their own income criteria. So what was in your packet included um, some support with regard to the supplemental nutrition program, um, supplemental um, income, disability, just to show you that each of those programs that are the other criteria for the exemption, they all have their own income criteria built in. And those agencies are reviewing and updating that income criteria on a regular basis. So I think it's redundant for us to have our own income threshold. So rather than having uh, two, two qualifiers to qualify for our <clears throat> hardship exemption, I suggest that we get rid of the income threshold and just leave it that if somebody qualifies for, you know, supplemental for nutrition assistance or um, supplemental income or disability, um, the other things that are mentioned in there, that that's, that's all they need because each of those has their own income criteria already. So I would like to um, update that resolution so that we can keep the folks who really need it um, in a status where they qualify for the exemption. All right, it's all about simplifying things for those who really need to take advantage of this. I think it's a great idea. Um, if the council likes where this is going, it'll come before you as a resolution next month. Are there any comments from council? Do you agree with this? Councilman Bigliotti? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, you know, when this was enacted back in 2013, I thought it was a good idea. I still think it's a good idea that we are able to uh, render assistance to people who need it. Uh, I guess I just have one or two general questions about uh, this as it stands. Um, uh, and, and they kind of both uh, relate to each other. So if you'd like, I can give you both questions at the same time. Uh, the first question is how different would this be if we were to adopt the uh, 2020 income criteria that we have in our packets based on what we do for ourselves? Uh, and then relating to that, uh, given our own, I, I guess, median income and our own levels of income in this area, how would that different? How would that differently affect residents who have income that is different than it would be elsewhere? that they drew these uh, criteria from, if that makes sense. Okay, so I think, let me, let me make sure that I understand at least one of the questions. I think you're asking is whether these income requirements are, 
are general or are they more specific to our area, which may be more or less poverty stricken? Is that kind of what you're asking? Exactly. I want to know whether this will make things like it's harder or easier for people in this area who need it or whether or not they might not qualify based on, again, if there is a differing threshold between the two. I see. I think it's going to make it easier for people to qualify because currently they need to meet two of those criteria. Um, and so the only one that was independently done for the city of Tawny Town was the income criteria was specifically having to provide that detail. So they would still individuals to qualify would still have to meet one of the, the requirements for one of the other programs like the energy assistance or the, the nutrition assistance. Um, so they would still be having to meet one of those other program criteria in addition to the Tawny Town income criteria. So now we're going to relieve them of that Tawny Town income criteria and, and the other, you know, they still have to do the same thing they would have to do previously to qualify for the nutrition or the energy assistance or supplemental income. So I think it eases it for people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions from the Council on this topic? Okay, do we have consensus for staff to move forward and draft the resolution for this? All right, very good. Uh, then we will not have that on the uh, agenda for Monday, but you will see it next month in the form of a resolution. Thank you. Moving on to renovation of council chambers. As city manager talked about earlier, uh, we were asked by the county, well, by the state through the county uh, to try and take advantage of as much of the CARES Act funding as we can. Um, I know at one point uh, they were worried that people weren't taking advantage and the money was essentially going to be wasted. Uh, we got together and came up with a great solution where one of the issues we've had in the council chambers has been our audio system and the lack of video system. As we get into, as the pandemic progresses, whether we do hybrid meetings, uh, straight on in-person meetings, non-public meetings, however you want to do it, we would really need a better AV system that can manage those things. Uh, so this, uh, Dan Dennis did put out uh, for proposals from several AV companies, and I worked with him on looking at it. AV was kind of in my bailiwick from a previous career. Um, and we settled on what we believe is the best uh, for what we're looking for. It's going to provide uh, adequate audio, sufficient microphones that everyone will have a mic, uh, including the staff table and a proposed delegation table. It would have mounted displays. That way we're not projecting up on the wall off to the side and making Jim's head glow with a projector. So it's it would be something built for our council chambers. I think it would be spectacular to have. Uh, there would be cameras mounted that Dan is able to uh, control remotely uh, even if he's from his house, he can dial in, control the cameras, move them around, focus on people's faces. Uh, that way, when we're streaming these, and as you know, after this, you know, people expect the streaming to continue, and I think we should. This will allow us to provide a better product, focus in on people, and hopefully get people more engaged in what we're doing here. So along with that, you do see the proposal from Syscom, which is the vendor that we had selected to be the best bang for the buck, and I believe the better system for us. Uh, along with that, there are a couple other things that we want to discuss. First off, uh, we discussed changing the council chambers by flipping them 180 degrees. And I'm going to see, stand by. All right, can you see that? I can't see you if you're giving a thumbs up, so. Yes, we can there. All right, perfect, thank you very much. So this is a real quick th uh, 3D rendering of what we're kind of proposing. If you imagine where the council table is now, 
it would be picked up, moved across the room, put in front of the large fake blue doors. Um, above it, you'll see there are two speakers here. There will be two displays for the gallery, for staff, and for a delegation table to view. In front of the delegation table would be a third display that the council would be able to see. A uh, couple ideas behind this. First off, obviously having the video display for everybody makes it much easier. Um, the other thing is, as I spoke to our chief of police, we talked about all security measures in City Hall. One thing that came up was the council chambers. That being right now when people come in off the elevator, they're walking into the front of the room. Um, when you look at it from a security standpoint, that is rather concerning. It's also rather disruptive to the meeting. By flipping this around, they would be entering more towards the back of the room, uh, which also allows for when we have police officers in the meeting, they can be seated in a location where they can see who's coming and going. Uh, we also talked to Dan Dennis about uh, having a video display off to the side that they can see the cameras throughout the building to know who's coming in and out. Just further going along with uh, securing City Hall. So the AV cost that you see in the proposal is part of it, that's, but that's what was approved by the County from CARES Act. So that grant covers the AV side of things completely uh, in around $56,000. Uh, the other things that we would like to request is this delegation table here. The idea is right now we bring in a folding table and it, it kind of looks bad and really it's, it's just not appropriate. This would essentially be a copy of the current staff table uh, a member of our city staff is able to fabricate this. He gave us a price of about $2,100, which is a tremendous deal for us, considering custom made, they usually run between five and $8,000. So we would ask for additional money simply to construct uh, the delegation table here that would be permanently in place and would have microphones on it. That way, whenever delegations come to us, we're prepared for them. I'm going to stop sharing now unless there are questions. Does anyone have questions about what I've shown you? Many. Councilman Haynes, please. Um, so I don't mean to sound ignorant with this question, but kind of tying in with the security concerns, is the public still able to access the chambers via the stairs? They would not be. Okay. When we renovated City Hall downstairs, that door leading to those stairs is now access controlled. Um, so on a council night, they'd be able to come into the lobby and they could only come through the elevator to come upstairs. Now, those other stairs are available for exit. Uh, obviously for fire emergency, things like that, uh, you are able to leave through that door over there that you can't see and go down the stairs and leave. Um, but they would not be able to come up those stairs uh, from the lobby. And I have one more question, if that's okay. Um, yep. So it might sound like nitpicking, but Genuinely just curious. Um, I think the delegation table is a great idea, especially aesthetically. Um, but will it actually be that close to the council bench? Because I feel like with the city manager and the attorney, they want to be able to make eye contact with those people. Would they be able to have the table a little farther back? Or is that just the way the design was set up? Well, when I put it in there, I envisioned it, the front of it, even with the end of the staff table. And a lot of that reason is, remember, we still have to put the gallery behind them. If we move it too far back, we're kind of taking away chairs from the public, and I don't want to cut down on how many people can attend our meetings. Um, I guess most of the time, as long as we have one or two chairs, we'll cover the public, but I would like to have some extras there. So that's why that was in place. Now, keep in mind, with the, the camera system being proposed, most of the time, visuals of those people talking will be displayed on the televisions there and the television that would be in front of council, uh, which is viewable from anywhere in the room. So they would be able to be seen as well. Okay. okay. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Council. Assuming we do move forward with the delegation table, just a, a quick comment. Um, we'll ensure that with the, the monitor that the mayor referenced that will be in front of that table uh, for the mayor and council to view, We'll make certainly make sure that you have a good line of sight with that, that the table is spaced so that you'll be able to easily see that monitor. So there there might be a little bit of of you know fine tuning to do, but but as the mayor said, you know, proportionately that's the line, the um the line for it. And we do need to keep in mind 
space for the the gallery. Yeah, the, the 3D rendering was was kind of a quick throw together just to give you a visual of what we're talking about here. So it's rough measurements, we'll say. Um, any other comments or questions? Okay. Is there any opposition to the project being proposed? Okay. I believe, Mr. Weeprick, that you're going to be asking council to ratify uh, the agreement with SISTCOM. Is that correct? That is correct. And while we're, before we move on, I will also just uh, give you all a heads up that when we do our mid-year budget amendment, that we will be having some amendments related to the Corona relief fund money that we received because we did not budget for that money. And with the inclusion of this project, we will have received over $100,000 in grant funds um, that we've used for, um, some of it went to police overtime. We purchased additional um, uh, devices to be deployed to improve our remote work capabilities. Uh, that was our second bite at the apple, so to speak. And now with this one, we'll have you know more revenue coming in as well as the additional expense. So while it's a wash, we do want to reflect that in the budget. So this will be included on your mid-year budget amendment. All right, very good. Um, Mr. Dennis, would you like to add anything to this discussion? You worked very hard on getting this to the county and getting it approved. Uh, are you around to say anything? Thank you, Mr. Dennis, again, for your hard work in getting this put through. Um, I think it's a great plan. It's a great proposal that we have in front of us. Um, I do hope that uh, with council's approval, we can move forward uh, on all of these changes that we've proposed. Uh, it does lend itself to continuity of government. And that's been a big part of this pandemic is finding the best ways for all governments to be able to proceed under these conditions. And this is another that's gonna help us uh, guarantee our continuity uh, with this. Any questions from the council? All right, Councilman Vigliotti. I just want to briefly echo what uh, you've said, Mayor, and what Dan has said. You know, thank you to you, Dan, for all the work that you've put into this, and, and thank you to the county as well for uh, being so amenable to allowing us to continue to, or helping us to allow us to continue to serve our constituents. Very good, thank you. Anyone else? Very good. I'm going to ask Mr. Weeprick, do you want anything tonight to move forward or do you want to hold this until Monday? We can wait until Monday. Um, I'd like just ratification on the on the agreement at that point. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll discuss this again Monday evening looking for ratification. Moving into MDE sewer compliance. Great topic. Uh, if you saw the email from, I believe, Jay earlier, uh, this is different.
as it could when you have a situation like this. But it's it's circled around now, so MB is getting back to assessing those penalties. Uh, the other one was actually a pump failure at the treatment plant uh, that was considered an illicit discharge by MDE. And once again, uh, they're now circling around to hitting us with the administrative penalties. So the amount is not large. Uh, we're talking about $3,764. And um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of detail on how MBE calculates the fines. We know the factors that go into it, but it's kind of like one of those black box situations where they put the figures in and the ratings in on one screen, and then they get the fine output on another, and nobody can really tell us what happens in between. So because this is a relatively modest dollar amount, the staff recommendation is that we just go ahead and and pay the fines and move on to our next issue. So Monday night, we'll be asking for approval to um, to pay MBE for those uh, administrative penalties. All right, any questions from council on that piece of good news? Okay, fortunately, it is a very small fine. When we talked about uh, fighting it, it, we just figured the juice wasn't worth the squeeze in this point. So we'll, uh, We'll just knuckle under and I believe pay that if council approves on Monday evening. All right, no other discussion there. We'll move into item number seven, CDM Smith 2021 rate proposal. Who do I punt it to? Well, again, it's it's uh, in your packet. Uh, we do this once a year and again, CDM has, uh, has held their rates um, stable for us um i'm sure if, if you'd like brian can uh elaborate a little bit on that but um cdm has been our engineer for many years now and we've been very happy all in all with 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 the services provided and the expertise that they can provide for us um so this i i don't really even see it as being a, a question but we will be looking for approval on uh, monday night for this all right. Any questions? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm speaking for the rest of the company. You know, we we appreciate um, working with you. Uh, and, and personally, I can say, you know, I've, Tony Town was one of the first clients I worked for at CDM Smith when I started, and I'm you know, I'm happy to say that it's been 19 years that I've been working for the city, and, and I can't can't uh, imagine working with a, a better group of people that makes it you know good to go to work. Well, used to go to work. Now I just go to my bedroom. But uh, regardless. Uh, Thank you. Oh, shucks. You're making me blush. Um, <laughs> no, I think CDM Smith has done a tremendous job for the city. And I know we've given them so many different projects to work on. They come through uh, very well, especially with all the park projects, the uh, water sewer projects, street, you name it. They've been working on it and done a tremendous job. And we greatly appreciate that. Um, any comments from the council or questions on the proposed rates? Very good. Uh, hopefully you can approve on Monday evening and we can continue the strong relationship we have with CDM Smith. Uh, last item under new business is our I and I engineering proposal from CDM Smith. Mr. Lubenow, are you gonna hit that for us? I can, yeah, sure. And, and Jim, when I'm done, if you have anything to add. Um, uh, but yeah, the, it, I'll, I'll say Jim's line, it's, it's in your packet. Um, the uh, this is related to the ongoing um, sewer compliance, um, specifically related to I and I reduction inflow and in infiltration reduction. So what we're envisioning is two design projects, and, um, and and bidding those projects and then construction services, with the two projects being a um, sewer replacement in the vicinity of the um, York Street pump station and Meadowbrook development. And then the second project being a sewer lining kind of throughout the city to um, line old terracotta pipes to reduce um, infiltration into those piping networks. So again, this, this is to reduce flow to the plant, which ultimately drives um, better compliance for nutrient removal at the plant. And I will just add on to that, that uh, we did talk about this project several months ago. You may recall during the construction of the O'Brien Avenue Bridge, 
that there was a sewer line relocation and we found that when the old terracotta sewer line was replaced with with modern materials that we saw a notable drop in flows at the york street pumping station uh, where this line flows to uh, so at that point we decided that a a good project to pursue uh, to try to reduce our i and i even further was to continue replacement of that line between the point where the new line ends at the bridge and the York Street pumping station. So initially we had talked about doing a, a cured in place lining or something for the pipe, but there's a number of spots where we're gonna have to do replacement. And um, so right now we're envisioning uh, because of the cost factors that in it looks like it's going to be a better project overall if we do part replacement and part lining. Um, so really kind of two separate projects for it, but the same same thing we essentially talked about back when the O'Brien Avenue Bridge was under construction. Uh, so council did give us the okay at that point to move forward on the project. And this is going to be just the first of a number of such projects where we're trying to get rid of this old terracotta line to reduce our I&I and, &I and recover capacity at the treatment plant that way. So uh, just wanted to kind of throw that background back at you. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Uh, you all see the proposal in front of you. Are there any questions uh, for either Mr. Weeprick or Mr. Lubenow on the proposal for this project? Okay. What is the anticipated actual completion of this? I see several dates on here. Can you give me a just in words, when you'd expect to be finished with this project? Sure. Um, yeah, let me just open it up here. So there's the two different phases, like I mentioned. Generally speaking, the um, design would be this winter for the, the Meadowbrook interceptor replacement. The, the, the lining contract would lag a bit just because we have some ongoing identification of, of, of problem areas that's still in process. So that design would lag um, a bit into the spring. Um, we would be bidding in the summer with construction, you know, summer into fall of next year. And, and to add a bit onto what um, Jim said, the lining contract would, would encompass the remainder of that um, interceptor between the bridge and the pumping station, but we've also structured it such that we could cover um, other sewers identified as problem areas throughout the city. So there's a, um, it, it would likely include multiple areas where we would have that lining improvement done. If I could put you on the spot, in our overall I and I issues, of which we have many, could you attach a percentage of, of how this will affect our issues, how much of it this would resolve? Yeah, we made a, um, a recommend or a, an estimate after the, um, after the bridge replacement. Mm -hmm. um, we made an estimate as to what we would think that this follow-up project on the Meadowbrook Interceptor alone would, um, would accomplish. And I can't remember, I don't want to make up that number, but I, I, I'll get it to you, Mr. Mayor. Um, but uh, I mean, we're, we're it's like Jim said about the first one, it was noticeable. And, and when you talk an I and I, a lot of times, you know, one rainstorm is different than the other. So it's really hard to, to, to pinpoint numbers. But when you can see when you do one project, and you know you have your uh, public works department saying, "Wow, that that was a that was a big change." Like they can see it. it so when it's noticeable, um, that's something to to, to celebrate. Um, so that's the reason for the extension. So we're hoping for again another noticeable reduction. But you know, I I honestly think the ultimate solution, like many other systems of this age, all of the terracotta pipe will eventually be either replaced or lined. I mean, that's, that's, that's going to be the ultimate solution. And then you'll get to a system that has, you know, more reasonable 10, 15%, 20% type of peaks when it rains, as opposed to what you see now, which is, um, you know, 300, 400%. Okay. 
right? Okay, we do have a substantial INI problem in the city and the aging infrastructure definitely is the main cause. So anything we need to fix that, but of course it's, this will be early in all of the projects that'll be required to get this done. That's for sure. But baby steps would help. Mr. Weeprick? And just a reminder, we will be coming back to you with, with another presentation on on the uh, treatment plan and our, our INI efforts. So, you know, the whole the whole sewer capacity issue that we've been talking about in recent months. So um, the public works department is continuing to inventory uh, manholes and sewer line to uh, and they're also geolocating them and everything like that. So that when we do get to the point of design, we'll have better data to start with. But that project, that process is ongoing. And once DPW has completed that inventory, we will then be able to start developing a, a project list for those INI projects. And I, I'm not sure that we will be back to you in January. Uh, I would hope we could be, but I can't promise that uh, because the inventory is not done yet. Um, so that's going to determine how quickly we can be back to you with another um, presentation, I guess, on the, the sewer capacity issue. All right, I'll throw it to the council. Do you have any questions or comments on the proposal or for Mr. Lubin out while he's with us this evening? All right, everyone seems satisfied. Very good. Anything else to add from staff? Everything else is good? All right, very good. That's the last of our new business. I do want to remind council, uh, tomorrow evening is our MML chapter dinner, not dinner, excuse me, virtual meeting. Um, I did send out the link if you're able to attend. Uh, that would be great to see you there. Uh, I'll begin that by telephone, but hopefully get on video later in the meeting. Uh, the last thing I do want to mention, um, our Christmas tree lighting that was supposed to happen on Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, we did cancel it. And of course, there's speculation, well, why'd you cancel? Why'd you do this? COVID's killing us, et cetera. Um, we watched the weather very closely throughout the week. And each day when we looked at it, the forecast was getting worse and worse. By the time uh, I told Lorena that one o'clock on Thursday, we were going to talk, make a final decision. Uh, it was saying 75% chance of up to an inch of rain and 25 to 30 mile an hour winds. In my opinion, that is not spectacular conditions to have a tree lighting. Uh, so I made the decision to cancel it. We had not set a rain date, so therefore it simply did not happen. Um, in the meantime, we are putting together something special for the tree lighting. Uh, it will be in video format. That way people can watch it over and over again and love it forever and ever. Um, I've asked some of you to be involved in that, but we are starting to put that together. Uh, so to any residents that watch this, I'm sorry, I made the decision I felt was best. Uh, it was particularly windy that day, um, but we are gonna try to make it up to you, give you something a little special, give you the warm fuzzies that we deserve around Christmas time. Uh, with that and nothing else, I will seek a motion to adjourn. Moved. And a second, please. No one wants to go home? Second. Very good. We have a motion from Councilman Haynes and a second from Mayor Pro Tem Foster. All in favor of adjourning, please uh, give a thumbs up. All right. With that, we are adjourned. I will see you all Monday evening. Thank you all. Bye, everybody.